Um, I'm Charles Melville, the president of BIPS at the moment, and it's my great pleasure to introduce um, our uh, AGM lecture, which is actually just finished after our AGM earlier this afternoon. Uh, I should mention first that it's been dedicated to the memory of Abdullah Guchani, who was um, a well-known epigrapher, numismatist and art historian who died in August this year, 2020, well known to many members of BIPS, BIPS researchers and the international scholarly community for his work on um, inscriptions and um, many aspects of Islamic art. Uh, a recent book was called Luster Tiles of the Shrine of Imam Reza, published in 2019, for instance. Uh, so this is uh, just to honour his memory at the first opportunity we've had to do so. Um, but our speaker this afternoon uh, and lunchtime in America is <laughs> Professor Sheila Blair, who uh, barely needs introduction. As you know, she's uh, been a professor of Islamic art at Boston College and Norma Jean Calderwood Professor, shared a post shared with her husband, Jonathan Bloom. Uh, and together, of course, they've produced millions of books, really, on her <laughs> short... <laughs> her short uh, little CV bio notice on the website, she modestly refers to scores of books and hundreds of articles on various aspects of Islamic art uh, and especially the Mongol period, which of course is true. I thought I might just very quickly mention a couple uh, like Islamic Art Past, Present and Future, published in 2019, uh, images of Paradise in Islamic Art, uh, produced 20 years before that, 1991. Art and Architecture of Islam, 1250 to 1800. Uh, God is Beautiful and Loves Beautif Beauty, Yale University Press, 2013, uh, and many more. But particularly, I think, um, in view of our topic uh, today, uh, the seminal work published with Oleg Grabar in 1980 called Epic Images of Contempor and Contemporary History, the illustrations of the great Mongol Shahnami, which really continues to be a subject of uh, interest and research. Uh, that was published, as I say, uh, 40 years ago now, so it shows what a long and glorious career Sheila's had. And of course, the other outstanding uh, work, I think, alongside many recent publications with the Edinburgh University Press, is um, her book on uh, Rashida Dean, the Compendium of Chronicles, Rashida Dean's history, illustrated history of the world, uh, as uh, part of the Khalili uh, collection series of publications from 1995. So really, who better, I think, than uh, Sheila to talk about her subject of art as a source for the history of Mongol Eurasia. And before letting her start, I'll just say that I'm expecting a talk to last about half an hour or thereabouts, and um, we'll probably have a little discussion, and then the uh, floor will be open for questions and answers. And um, you should have an opportunity to do a Q&A uh, box on your screens, and if you send in your questions, uh, identifying yourselves. Obviously, it's unlikely we'll be able to answer all of them, but I will channel most of them, if I can, to Sheila. So without more ado, Sheila, thank you very much, and over to you. Well, let me first thank Charles for inviting me, to Sylvia for setting this all up, and for all the participants who are here today. My topic, as you see, is art as a source for the history of Mongol Eurasia. As you probably know, the Mongols assembled the largest contiguous land empire ever known, stretching from the Sea of Japan all the way to the Euphrates. That's territory about the size of Africa. It was united as one um, Ulus under Chinggis Khan, but after his death in 1227, it was split among four uh, of his descendants into four collateral lines. His son Batu founded the Golden Horde, his oldest son in the West, his second son Chagatai, the Chagatayids in Central Asia, his grandson 
founded the Yuan Empire or the Empire of the Great Han on the map here, and his brother, the Ilkhanate. Now the traditional view of the Mongols is barbarians and savages, probably because most of the history of the Mongols was written by the people whom they had conquered. So this view was already current in the 13th century, epitomized in the uh, account by the Benedictine monk, Matthew of Paris, where you see this wonderful scene here of cannibals, of Mongol cannibals. His account mixes plentiful legends, speculations, but also some accurate facts. And even the depictions contain some accuracy. Note the hat here. We're going to see more of these kinds of hats. And I even wonder if this is supposed to be lamellar armor over here, something else that the Mongols used. But it's really in the past generation that we've had a total revamping of the view of the Mongol period, uh, especially since the opening up of China, and this is North China here. We're gonna hear more about Tibet as well. And the publication in 1997 of Tom Olson's seminal work, Commodity and Exchange in the Mongol Empire. In it, he traced the history of Islamic textiles, notably cloth, cloth of gold, and in his later publications, he expanded his Purdue to other topics such as paper, printing, and most recently, pearls, which was published posthumously last year. As a historian, he's interested in how written sources mention these material goods. But his books have terrible, if any, pictures. And what I'd like to do is take his arguments one step further here and show how the design, production, and decoration of these objects enhances and sometimes complicates our knowledge of this transcontinental circulation of commodities, ideologies, technologies, and peoples across the Mongol domains and beyond to Europe and East Asia. Now, over the past generation, scholars, oh, I would say beginning with Linda Komarov and Stefano Carboni in their seminal exhibition on the legacy of Genghis Khan, have managed to piece together this material culture of the Mongol court across Eurasia. And to do so, you really need to draw on a variety of sources, both extant objects and contemporary depictions, as well as texts describing them. Now, the best depictions come from Iran. So that's why we're having this as a lecture now. These are pages from Rashida Din's History of the Mongols, now detached and mounted in albums in Istanbul and Berlin. And you see a double page from one of them here in Berlin. These descriptions very carefully match uh, the description, these pictures match the descriptions by travelers such as William of Rubric. William said that Batu, the founder of the Golden Horde, sat on a throne that was deep and broad like a couch and completely overlaid with gold. It had steps leading up to it. One of his wives sat at his side with male courtiers to his right and females to his left. In front with a was a bench with hummus, that's fermented mare's milk, served in very large gold and silver goblets that were decorated with precious stones. It matches the, the picture here, but unfortunately, none of these objects survive in Iran. Most of them probably were melted down, but objects found elsewhere confirm the accuracy of these depictions. So if we look closer here, we can take a look at the robes to begin with. The same kind is depicted in this famous uh, silk portrait of Kublai. According to William, the Mongols always tied their robes to the right, whereas the Turks tied theirs to the left. And several of these robes have recently been unearthed and appeared on the recent art market. They have wide ribbed waists and they always tie to the right. And I have a detail here to show you how spectacular the cloth of gold is that was used to make these robes. But it's not only the robes and the silk portrait. These also show up in Italian paintings. 
Here is Lorenzetti's altarpiece from the Church of San Francisco in Siena, which shows a similar Mongol courtier with a robe that ties to the right with a wide banded waist. Other details from the paintings are equally accurate. Both the album paintings and the Kubalai portrait in silk show the Mongol men wearing a hat with a brim and a flap that hangs down the back. And Yuka Kadoi uncovered this hat in Ulaanbaatar. It was found in the Gobi Desert and it's now uh, in the museum there. It's made of silk, paper, leather, and hair. And similar hats with a brim and a flap down the back are shown in Lorenzetti's altarpiece. It also confirms that the hats were trimmed with owl and eagle feathers, just as shown in the depictions from the album pages. Mongol women wore an even more distinctive hat, known as a buchtak. William, who calls it a buka, describes it as made of tree bark, more than a cubit high, square at the top like the capital of a column. It was hollow inside, he said, and covered with silk cloth and extended at the top with feathers. It's long been known from Yuan portraits, such as this one of Kublai's wife, Chabi. But examples recently found and now on the art market, or this one's now in Doha, bear out the physical reality. This one measures almost a meter tall when intact. It had a column-shaped frame with a bark cloth covered by gold cloth that was cut in the shape of a hat. The hat was attached with another hat, which had a hole in the middle, and this long column stuck up almost a meter over the head. It was further adorned with feathers and metal spires, pearls, and gold jewelry. So these ladies were really decked out. Like individual examples of dress, we can, we can follow other accoutrements of the court. The Mongol couple often shared stemmed or handled cups. None are known from Iran, where they were probably melted down in times of need. But several examples in both gold and silver have been excavated at the Golden Horde capital, Sarai Berka, and some have also recently been found on the Mongolian or Kipchak steppes. We can trace other accoutrements as well. In several scenes, the attendant is shown wearing uh, or carrying a rounded bag with a flap. And for those of you, there he is carrying, there she is, he carrying the flap. For those of you who watched The Crown, I can only think of Margaret Thatcher clutching her handbag. Examples of such bags made of leather over bamboo, wood with metal mounts were a specialty of Wenzhou on the south coast of China. They were typically decorated with auspicious animals. And like the silk robes, such coffers have recently turned up on the art market, supposedly found in Nepal, where they were brought by refugees fleeing from Tibet. These lacquered boxes may in turn have been the prototypes for smaller metal ones made in the Ilkhanate. The example on the left here, the inlaid metal coffer, is one of the finest inlaid brasses to survive from the Islamic lands. Acquired by the European collector, Thomas Gambier Perry in 1858, perhaps in Northern Italy. It has only recently been the subject of, a re of an exhaustive study such that it can be localized to Mosul, around 1330. While the shape is similar, the scenes of auspicious animals on the lacquer prototypes have been replaced on the metal bag with depictions of mounted hunts huntsmen on the front and the back. And by 14 smaller roundels with revelers, all of them wearing turbans. And you see someone here playing the equivalent of a tambourine. Album illustrations 
document other shared Mongol customs as well. This scene, identified by comparisons with later manuscripts, shows Hulagu, the founder of the Ilkhanid line, attacking Alamut, one of his major victories in subduing Iran. And I think you can all by now tell he's a Mongol. He wears a robe that crosses to the right. He has a hat with a flap in the front, uh, a brim in the front and a flap in the back, trimmed with feathers. He's under the royal parasol and the horse in front carries his royal stool. But what's interesting about this depiction is that ahead of him is an envoy, identified because he carries a paisa, a passport or self-conduct pass. Contemporaries describe it as a tablet of authority made of wood, silver or gold, and embellished with a tiger or gear falcon at the top, depending on the rank and the importance of the holder. It's carried typically by an ilchi, an envoy traveling on official business. And one might note here the pointed hat on the ilchi, exactly the same kind of hat we saw on Matthew of Paris's illustration at the beginning. Marco Polo was particularly in, uh, impressed by this system of postal communication. And he describes how travelers could go up to 200 miles a day using this postal network. Now such plaques known from Liao and Yuan China, the Golden Horde and the Ilkhanate show how a common item could be transferred and transformed to local needs in shape, language or iconography. Earlier ones seemed to have been rectangular with a hole. Later ones had a scalloped or rounded body. Languages and scripts evolved as well. They're inscribed in everything from Hittan to Pagspai, Uyghur and Arabic. And here are some of the different languages on one in St. Petersburg. Iconography evolved as well. In addition to writing, Later ones have figural imagery, a stylized dragon face, or on this Ilhanid one, a striding envoy. And this is one I should point out that Abdullah Guchani was the first to publish. It's also interesting to note that on the Iranian example, we have a figure carrying out the action that would have been used on the object on which it's inscribed. This courtly culture thus was shared across the Mongol domains, but could be adapted to local tastes and traditions. And here I should like to look in detail at two types of objects in different media to show how our understanding of this transcontinental circulation of commodities, ideologies, technologies, and peoples across the Mongol domains has changed in light of recent discoveries point out some of the questions raised by these newly discovered objects. I can't answer all or even many of these questions, so I hope our discussion will provide new light on a rapidly changing field. So my first type of object are blue and white porcelains, the type of luxury where the best embodies exchanges across Asia under the Mongols and the complications in discussing. And in this field too, new questions are occurring regularly. The basic chronology of blue and white ceramics was already established by 1956 when John Pope published his landmark monograph on them. He and others traced the production from the early 14th century at the imperial kilns of Jingdi Zhen, marked here on the map on Southeast China, where it was shipped sometimes by land, but much more often by sea from Guangzhou and other ports. There was a flourishing mercantile trade under the control of Ortois, powerful Muslim Mongol trade organizations. They traded not only in porcelains, but metals, coins, aromatics, sugars, spices, dyes, and a host of other goods. Much of the trade went through Hormuz on the Gulf, and sherds of black and white porcelain found there attest to its role already in the early 14th century. And here's where more careful archaeology of sites outside China may actually add to our ability to take to trade 
to date this trade and also to date early blue and white China. The amount of trade in porcelains can be seen in the largest collection of blue and white found outside of China, the one studied by Pope 70 years ago, the collection donated in 1608 by the Safavid Shah of Iran, Abbas II, to the shrine of Sheikh Safi at Ardabil in honor of his eponymous ancestor. In 1611, three years after the donation, the porcelains were installed in a newly built hall, the so-called Chini Hane, or House of Porcelains. The gift amounted to 1162 porcelains, three quarters of them blue and white, a staggering amount. Many of them now on display in the National Museum and the largest collection of blue and white outside of China. The form, layout, and painting of these early blue and white porcelains confirm that many of the earliest wares were made specifically for export to Iran. Take, for example, this large plate or charger from Ardabil. Measuring 58 centimeters in diameter, it's the largest plate known. Its shape makes it suitable for the serving of communal food, a typical custom in West Asia, but not in China. The decoration around it is arranged in concentric circles. Again, not something typical of Chinese wares, but often used on Iranian ones, as on this contemporary inlaid brass tray. This one in the British Museum, for example, has concentric circles, but is slightly smaller. And I've actually sized them here. It's about one fifth smaller. Consumers must have paid high prices to have these blue and these large blue and white chargers shipped all the way from China. The technique of the blue and white porcelain also confirms the connection to Iran. This detail shows it's painted in reserve. That is, the background is painted with blue, leaving the white surface of the porcelain to display the design. Such a reserve technique is typical of the luster wares produced at Kashan in Iran since the turn of the 14th, 13th century. And I show you a detail of a luster tile here. In contrast, when making wares for domestic use, painters of blue and white porcelain painted, direct, painted the design directly on the surface for Chinese wares. Such direct painting uses far less cobalt, an expensive material that itself was imported from Omsar in Kashan, the site where the luster wares had been produced since the 13th century. It was taken overland to the Gulf and then shipped to China. One further detail of this charger confirms the link between Iran and China in the production of these early blue and white porcelains. The underside that's underneath the, the plate is inscribed in blue under the glaze. The inscription is distinct therefore from the uh, marks of ownership made by Shah Abbas on the porcelains he gave to the shrine at Ardabil. Those ones are inscribed in the glaze and added after production. This inscription is written in blue under the glaze, so it must have been done at the time of production. It's written in Arabic. The reading is unclear. The first scholar thought that it suggested, uh, it referred to the name of the potter. Jeremy John suggested to me that it might be a jumbled version of the word Jingdijen, the place where these porcelains are produced, a hallmark, just as Limoges is written under the foot of various porcelains that you buy today. And I'd be interested from the audience to hear what they think this inscription might say. Whatever the reading, the inscription shows the involvement of people from the lands of West Asia, where local languages such as Persian were written in Arabic script. These ceramics and other objects, such as textiles, were the means that motifs could be transferred across areas. The dragon, the phoenix, the peony, and the lotus 
all appear at this period in West Asia. Although it's doubtful whether any of these motifs retained the original significance. The dragon, for example, comes to Iran, but whereas it had been a uh, protective, auspicious motif in China, it becomes a monster in the West. It's still in Iran, retains its auspicious connotations found here on a tile used at Takhte Suleiman and on a wall relief found near Sultania. Shapes were often transferred in this period as well. Metalware forms, and you see a stem cup from Iran, could be reproduced in ceramic. And interestingly, they were also produced exactly the same shape in blue and white. This piece here, which I owe knowledge of to Shane McCausland, my co-author on um, the history of Mongol art that we're preparing for the Cambridge history of the Mongols is one of the earliest blue and whites excavated in China. It's a stem cup, similar to the one in metal known from Iran, and it's inscribed with a quatrain of the type found on Persian wares. It has a poem addressing the cup itself as a vessel for the sweet wine of pleasure similar to the poem that's found on the bronze cup. One thing separates the bronze cup from the early blue and white porcelain, and that's the pictures of the figures. The figures on the bronze cup are actually drinking from cups of the type that the cup is. So it's a triple pun. There's a poem about drinking on a drinking cup decorated with people drinking from it. All of these objects then show the active trade across the Mongol lands, both east to west and west to east. The cobalt came from Kashan, the ceramics came from Xinjiang, and the movement of people and ideas resulted in an active movement. The resultant, the, sorry, the movement of people and objects resulted in an active movement of ideas. The second type of object I'd like to look at quickly here is the knotted carpet, because its diffusion illustrates other aspects of commodity and exchange in the Mongol period. A small group dating to the late 13th or 14th century were preserved in Anatolia, from which a few have been spirited away. So I show you one that's still in Anatolia and one that's been taken to Europe. These early Anatolian carpets have a central field with geometric designs surrounded by a border with pseudo-Kufic inscriptions. Having scoured Anatolia, it does not seem that many more will be found. But recently, a different type of carpet with a, uh, with a similar border, but a different design in the field have come to light on the art market. Most of them probably from Tibet. And these are the group known as animal carpets. This small one, for example, was purchased by the Metropolitan Museum in 1990. It's said to have been discovered in Kathmandu during the 1980s, and a Buddhist monk had reportedly saved it from a Tibetan monastery. So it's the Chinese occupation of Tibet that seems to have caused a whole slew of objects to have come out on the art market. It's similar to this much larger one, recently acquired by the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha. It too has re was reportedly from a Tibetan monastery, a suggestion confirmed by the amount of wax impregnated into it that was uncovered during conservation. Such waxy residue is typical of, con of textiles and carpets from Tibetan monasteries, which were once illuminated by thousands of yak butter candles. And I would also say that the condition suggest that it had been stored folded. To judge from their designs, some of which can be documented precisely in Ilhan and painting, and Charles, you'll be happy to see I'm still interested in the great Mongol Shahnameh, uh, my first publication, my first major publication. Years ago, Richard Eddinghausen pointed out that the design on this carpet showed an animal 
And you see it here in a detail and then a drawing there. And it's very similar with its raised foreleg to the same kinds of animals that are coming up on these carpets now. Such animal carpets must have been exported to Europe as well, for they show up in 15th century paintings down to the raised foreleg. The carpets were thus a valuable commodity. They appear usually under the feet of the Virgin, but they appear in Italian painting only a century after they were presumably made. Does the time lapse indicate they were restricted to courtly use in Iran and only exported decades later? Did it take time to create a market and a taste? Both of these, all of these animal carpets, both the surviving ones and the ones seen in Italian paintings, typically have borders of stylized Kufic script. Similar carpets with a central field surrounded by a border of stylized Kufic script were exported to the East as well, specifically to Japan. And a group of 21 were used to decorate floats at the annual, at the annual Xi'an festival in Kyoto. And I just show you here the typical festival and here two of this group of 21 that are now in Japan. They have similar pseudo Kufic borders, but their fields, that's the center of the carpet, is very different. They have Chinese motifs, such as a prunus branch or two lions playing with a ball. Dated initially to the 18th or 19th century, they've recently been redated to the 14th or 15th. A redating confirmed by a carbon dating of one in a private collection which has a similar Kufic border and a geometric design and can be dated on the basis of tests to the 14th or early 15th century. This group of carpets from Kyoto then document not only that some knotted carpets were produced for the East Asian market, but they also show the value of regional, sometimes unexplored sources. These carpets also raise many questions. If they were indeed woven in Mongolia, were carpet weavers transferred there from Northwestern Iran? We know that the Mongols often transferred workers. Do these carpets document a similar transfer of carpet weavers? The 21 Kyoto carpets also form a coherent group. Most are about two meters long and they share a small repertory of scenes. If they were made as a group, who were they made for? A third question, how was the taste for these carpets created? The export of animal carpets to the West suggests that it took a century to, trans to create a taste. And finally, these Kyoto carpets raise questions about when they were transferred to Iran, uh, to, sorry, to Japan. James Watt, suggested that they were possibly taken from Yuan armies during the abortive invasion of Japan in the 1270s. But this date is much too early for the prototypes from Northwestern Iran date only from the mid to late 14th century. So what earlier times might have been later? To conclude, many of these artistic innovations were not necessarily produced by or even for the Mongols themselves but it was under Mongol sovereignty in the 13th and 14th century that a climate developed to accept and even desire new and different features, ranging from individual motifs to designs and elements of style. Visual sources in the, senses, in the sense of objects and buildings helped to map the mental space of the period. These works are the result of increased commerce and the availability of models, but they also reflect a taste ready to accept the new and different, a taste established in the Mongol period and evidence of people, objects, and ideas on the move. Thank you.
thank you very much, Sheila. Just uh, reorganising my work top. <laughs> well, that was uh, predictably uh, stimulating and one should also say visually very rich and beautiful presentation. Thank you very much. Um, uh, well, I, I had a question. Um, uh, of course, it's what these tell us about the history mm -hmm. of the period. It's really, um, as you say, it's a sort of revealing the culture and the artistic production and it tells us more, I mean visually more about what people look like and what the sort of things they would have in their tents or on their horses or in their homes. Um, in terms of the manuscripts, which of course you cunningly avoided <laughs> talking about, uh, and Rashida Dean in particular, I mean it's a question really uh, how how sort of realistic they are, I suppose. It's, I know it's the wrong word to use in terms of art, but how much how much are they what we would now think of as a, a real likeness of what what was being done? And, uh, you know, there's sort of an impression in a sense, I suppose, or as an artistic <laughs> level that has to intervene. Right, except that what's interesting is that all the objects that we have are actually fit the pictures that we have yeah. of them. Yeah. So we have the same kind of hats that we found. We have the same kind of cups. We have the same kind of robes that fold, that cross over from one side to the other. Yes. Um, the question is, were these made from descriptions or were they made from earlier paintings? Mm. And that's something um, that we're still arguing about. Were there Chinese manuscripts brought or printed books perhaps much more likely i think printed books um, some of the objects were clearly brought um, so i think what's interesting is how accurate they actually are yeah yeah yes well it is remarkable i know you had always written quite a lot also about matching specific pictures yeah. with prototypes yeah. in in chinese uh, sources and it's, uh, what's interesting is about how many of them have been uncovered recently. And that's, um, a lot of them were probably preserved in Tibetan monasteries and only with the opening up of Tibet um, have we found them. Because we have no grave goods in Iran, no tomb goods, very few are preserved there. But I saw one Mongol tomb in um, Northern China, which is a typical Iranian tomb except that the people in the in it are buried with all these goods, just like these kinds of goods, these little handled cups, robes that cross to the right. Um, oh, really? so. yeah. Yes, well, um, I, 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 we have a couple of questions coming in. I just, I, I didn't have time to look terribly closely at that uh, mysterious inscription, but it ah. was just a, a, just a passing thought. The second word might be hakir. You know, like a, a sort of humble slave, you know, this use. Oh, Michael like Abdul Zaif. Except yeah, but I mean, it, it's just an ill informed guess. It just looked yeah. vaguely like Hakir. And I just wondered if it was okay. a sort of self effacing, uh, in which case the first part would be the name. And then it right. would. Right, right. Um, it's not a term I know that's used often in inscriptions of the period, but that right. doesn't mean since we're, we're presumably getting a potter in China writing this. Yeah, he might have known. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> just <knows> thought. <laughs> right, well, uh, we have a question from Isabel Miller. Mm -hmm. um, if the designs on the porcelain seem to indicate they were made for specific markets, mm -hmm. perhaps the mark indicates the destination rather than the place of origin. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and she I'm mentions that, that. Yeah. porcelain's <laughs> used as ballast. Of course, they could have... Uh, had different um I don't I don't think it could have been used simply as ballast these are much too expensive wares these had to be um either commissioned or sh ensure sure of finding a ready a very very well healed market at the other end yes um, yes it's not the sort of thing you'd likely chuck into the hold of a ship as no, no 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 I don't <laughs> think it's like straw or whatever um still and, but, 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 Sorry, I was just going to say there may be other evidence of a destination marked on it on the plate, though, sometimes, um, perhaps. And the question with these um, ones from Ardabil is, when did they come to Iran? I am of the opinion they came soon after they were made. Hmm. Many people think they came only in the Safavid period, but 
this is where more excavation of sites like Hormuz would tell us. Hormuz is those sherds I showed you already date from the 14th century. So, um, or the excavation levels seem to suggest the 14th century. So I think we need more excavations. But I like that idea of a destination. I hadn't thought of that. Well, there's no reason why the, the uh, ceramics shouldn't have been in uh, the Shah's collection, just like his manuscripts. I mean, he was... Well, I think they were probably in the Ilkhanid collection. That yes. It's got yeah. passed on down to the... Yeah, exactly. Uh, the Royal Library yeah. and the Royal... The Royal Trib Library, the Royal... Um, yeah. yeah. We have uh, Shane McCausland. Hello, oh, Sheila. Thanks okay. for your lecture. <laughs> I was uh, sliding slowly through the list of the participants. There are a few uh, familiar names. Anyway, thank you for your lecture. My question is about the equestrian in uh -huh. the Hulagu attacking Alamut image. Yeah. What is the iconic iconography of looking back towards the retainers? Why would a conqueror do this? Good, good question. I, I, I can't answer that, Shane. I don't know the answer to that, and I would have to think about that. Um, and why would he need an Ilchi? <laughs> All I can tell you is that in later manuscripts, where the manuscript is intact with the illustration, these ones are just cut out, the same, the same iconography of someone um, sitting on a horse with retainers behind him and an Ilchi in front is used to illustrate the scene of Kulugu attacking or en route to Alamut. Hmm. Um, and the reason it's done is that the only the major events of Mongol rulers' reigns are illustrated, and this is this is the biggie for for Hulagu. Um, I mean, that other than Baghdad, we have that one too. Um, well, of course, so, I have to think about that. Hmm. It was that picture, of course, that triggered my um, remark about how, how did that really what. What Hulagu uh -huh. marching on, uh, on Alamut really looked like, you know. Uh, so in that case, it's a it's a record of something else. I mean, it's not necessarily a record of the event so much as. Uh, ah, we well, see. I mean, Rashid Din is already writing. Yeah, sometime. Thirteen oh five, so yeah. seventy five years after the event took place, yeah. if yeah. not yeah. later. Yeah. When did Hulagu? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, is Isabel comes back with, I wasn't clear uh, uh -huh. enough. I meant other porcelains were used for the spice trade as a contrast to those. Yeah. Just to note different uses. Oh, yeah. I mean, we certainly know that um, celadons were shipped. Hmm. We have very few, I should say, that have, in, and this is, in fact, <laughs> we have this one. This is the only, that is the only, um, one I know that has an inscription under the glaze, hmm. on the underside. So we shouldn't say that uh, we should be careful with our evidence. Well, Rosalind Haddon says, huh? surely some of the porcelain were spoils of war between the Safavids and the Ottomans and much earlier. Uh, yes, I think the Ottomans took from the Safavids and that's why the second largest collection outside of um, Iran uh, is in outside of China, the collection of is in Istanbul. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, right, we're low on any more questions just at the moment. Wowed them all. They have to go home and think. <laughs> they have to go home and <laughs> They're think. They're all tired. Of they course, need to drink and I need my lunch. <laughs> yes, exactly. There may be uh, people watching on uh, live as well as the yeah. various ways of looking at this. And of course, yeah. it's always being filmed anyway, so there'll be a yes, chance to watch yeah. it again. Well, I, I think you've earned your lunch, <laughs> uh, <laughs> as Sheila, and, uh, and I hope Jonathan has run off now to... I think he's already departed. Yes. Boil the soup up, yeah. Yes, so exactly. anyway, That's well, exactly. that was that was terrific, and uh, and uh, had a very good audience, uh, a hundred over a hundred people watching. So that's excellent. Uh, and thank you very much. And is this going to be published, or is it just sort of work in progress that's going to go into the book? Well, you Shane and I um, pu are publishing, about to come out. We hope this chapter on art for the Cambridge history of the Mongols. Um, which I'm sure you are contributing to. Well, I've just been wondering whether that's ever going to appear. <laughs> when it's going to come out. And also for the 
other history of the Mongols, the Rutledge history of the mm. Mongols. The Mongols are in, I would say. They are. They're still in, you could say. They've never really <laughs> been at. Uh, there's a question from Facebook, uh, but I'm not sure that I can access that. I don't have Facebook. Uh, hang on, unless... Uh, unless Sylvia might. Yeah, so, uh, uh, well, actually, there's one from Rowena Abdurazak. Thank mm -hmm. you for an amazing lecture, Professor Blair. I like that. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> well, that's the, sort of, that's the sort of comment one needs. I have a question about the blue and white porcelain market for Iran. Can you talk more about the imported Chinese artists in Persia? That is a subject we know very little about. We know from Rashida Din's endowment that he, there are several people there who might be Chinese, but we, we don't know. We know they transferred goods. We know embassies came. It's very hard to find evidence of actual artisans coming. Several people have suggested that when uh, the imperial workshops in China, the imperial library was dis uh, the painting academy was dispersed, that some painters came directly to Iran. I have no evidence of that. I can easily tell you about objects, but I cannot tell you about any people that I know specifically came as artisans to Iran. Isabel Miller is in fine form. She's trying to <laughs> stop you from enjoying your lunch. On a lighter note, the Astana Ballet has a piece called Heritage of the Great Steppe with very Mongol headdresses. And then she sends a link. <laughs> well, some people think that the tall Mongol headdress was the source of the princess's hat in the West. You know, all the kind that little girls wear on Halloween when they dress up as princesses. Mm. Yes thought to be a Mongol, something that came from the Mongols. I, I've always wondered, incidentally, I mean, just uh, wasting time really, that, uh, or you mentioned the height of the thing. What does, do we know what the weight was? Because it must have been quite a business. No, and I, I should ask them in Doha because they actually have this one now, but you have to stuff it. And yeah. I'm not sure that they're up to, you know, right. taking their prized artifact and stuffing okay. it and seeing how much. But it must, you must have had to sit very still. I don't think you mm. could walk very far with Yes. Well, you get the impression from those marvellous Dietz pictures that they're sort of nodding. <laughs> I mean, the heads. Are well, maybe their heads. <laughs> <laughs> their neck. Is yes. <laughs> but, uh, well, of course, it also means that they weren't going through doorways. I mean, it was all out of doors, wasn't it? All yes, I don't think they rode these on horseback or whatever. No, yes. no. <laughs> anyway, um, well, I, I think I have another go at uh, thanking you very much. Okay. All right. Uh, I will thank you and I will. Uh, oh. I'll, I'll just uh, say anyone who has a question uh, standing will maybe contact you directly. Sheila, Absolutely. And, uh, thank that you very be. much. Yeah. Thank you. I enjoyed it and um, have a happy evening. Same to you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.